Okay. Well, I am going to get started here. And, and the thing that I plan to do is to talk to you guys about this topic of bears in your backyard and how to learn to peaceful, peacefully coexist with black bears. And um, what I plan to do is spend about 45 minutes going through some instructional guidance about how we go about living with bears or peacefully coexisting with bears. But I do want to tell you there's um, what I try to do for most of my talks, not every single talk works out this way, but certain talks are really good for um, certain nonprofits. Most of you know I have a long history with Appalachian Bear Center, or Appalachian Bear Rescue, it used to be the Bear Center, uh, over in East Tennessee. Since I moved west two years ago, I've struck up a great friendship with um, Brian Peterson, who heads up Bear Smart Durango. Very similar organization. They do not do bear rehab. However, they do do lots of bear education. And, um, and so with that being a nonprofit, what I do is I usually select a nonprofit for each one of these talks. And uh, if someone cannot join in and they're, they're a no-show, what I do then is take the registration fee and I donate it to whatever nonprofit. The reason being, um, I'm not teaching them anything, so I don't want to keep any of their money, and I could benefit some really good cause in my area. So, just wanted to tell you, Bear Smart Durango is the beneficiary of this presentation here. So, Irene, I just saw that you raised your hand. Not sure if you have a question, but if you do, go ahead and type it in the chat box. And in the meantime, I'm going to continue on my way. So anyway, the, the gist of this presentation is to learn about bears in your backyard. And so to get started, I know everyone or almost everyone here has already seen this before. Please bear with me. This is for the benefit of the folks that join in and really don't know who I am and who's given the presentation here. So just to go over quickly, um, I want people to know and feel comforted that your instructor, me, uh, has a lot of pretty good bear experience. Now, I did receive my degree in wildlife management back in the early 90s. I started my career in the mid-90s uh, working for an organization called the Appalachian Bear Center. Most of you know it now as the Appalachian Bear Rescue. Did that for about five years. That's where my passion for working with bears first began and it has not stopped since. Uh, after working with the Bear Center, I did take a position with the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, and because of my experience with bears at the Bear Center, I was promoted to the bear coordinator for the state of Tennessee. What that meant is I was responsible for managing black bears in the state of Tennessee. I did that position for about seven years, and I was promoted once again, and I became chief of wildlife for the state of Tennessee. And so that meant instead of being just over bears, I was over all animals in the state. It was a great job. It was absolutely wonderful. It got um, to the point where I was no longer having fun in the field. And so uh, that, that led to my move out west. But having been chief of wildlife in Tennessee, I was also appointed to a committee called the Large Carnivore, Carnivore Working Group. And so besides just managing bears in Tennessee, I was helping to manage bears in the entire Southeast. So having said that, throughout my career, I've got over 20 years of working with black bears. So you're not just listening to someone who's, who's read up on them, who just really likes them. This is someone that has actually lived their life working for and around bears. So... Um, the other gentleman who was supposed to join in and I was going to introduce, but I see, I, I don't see him in the attendee list, is Brian Peterson. He was the gentleman from Bear Smart Durango. Um, I invited him and hopefully he'll join in because he does incredible work out here in Southern Colorado. I'm in New Mexico, Brian's in Southern Colorado, but he heads up this Bear Smart program. And you can see he's been doing this for a long time, I think 15 years or so again, working with bears. So between myself and if Brian joins us, 
I could almost promise you we should be able to answer any any bear question or bear related question that you have. So to get started here, I know some folks have seen this slide before, but I think this is a great slide to start talking about bears because bears are one of those species that really, I don't want to say strike a nerve, but they strike this emotion, this feeling inside of people whenever you start discussing bears or if anyone ever ends up being around a bear. And the question right off the bat is, should we be afraid of bears? And I love starting this because what I'm going to do here is put up a picture of one of the deadliest animals in North America. And when you see this, and when I show it, if I'm live and I could hear the audience, the audience usually just gasps because they see the deadliest animal in North America because it's right there in that picture. But the thing is you have to look closely because it's sitting on that branch. It is not that big old black black bear in the background. If you watch real closely you see the bee buzzing around. If we're going to talk about one of the deadliest and scariest animals in North America we'd have to talk about the bee simply because about 50 people per year in North America die as a result of a bee. Now if you compare that with bears, there's usually less than two fatalities in all of North America, which includes United States and Canada. There's usually less than two fatalities. So when you compare those numbers, you're about 25 times more likely to be killed by a bee than a bear. And I don't know of too many people that are afraid to go outside, to go enjoy the outdoors, to go to go do what they love to do because they're afraid of encountering a bee. Yet there's a lot of people that are afraid of encountering a bear. So the moral of my talks, whenever I'm giving these bear talks, I want to teach people how to be smart, not to be afraid, because there's no reason to, to fear black bears. So here is another really important reason why this discussion about living with bears or bears in your backyard is so, so important. And I am a scientist, and we always look at numbers, we always look, look at graphs, but I think this is a really simple point to hammer home. So let's start by looking at populations within the last 50 years. And if you look at the human population, this is something that everybody understands. Over time, over the last 50 years, everyone knows the human population has increased. And this is what I love, especially when I give this presentation in person, because my next question is, what has the bear population done over the last 50 years? And this is what surprises me, because almost everyone in the audience usually says bear populations have gone down, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Bear po populations over the last 50 years have gone up incredibly. Now, it depends on where you are in North America. If you're out west, bear populations have stayed relatively the same. Bear populations on the east coast, however, and in many, many states, are on the rise. Because you have to understand, when European settlers settled North America, they extirpated, which is a fancy word for wiping out locally, they, they got... They cleared the area of many animals, and so bears were wiped out in most of eastern North America. Now, with the onset of these advanced game laws and people being concerned about wildlife, there's all these rules and regulations that protects wildlife, and so what has happened, game populations like deer and turkey and bears are increasing. So over the last 50 years, it's amazing what the bear populations have been doing. So you have human populations going up, you have bear populations going up, and so literally what we have here is, is we have worlds that are colliding. And so when you have a lot of people together and a lot of bears together, it's not a question of should we learn to live together? It's a question of, 
we have to learn to live together because it's inevitable. And this is a good thing. This is nothing to be afraid of. This is something to, um, to grasp and really latch onto. And one of the main reasons or one of the things I always tell people, and this always gets a chuckle, but I like people, but I love bears. And so all this work that I do and all this education that many folks are trying to do all over North America, it's not just for the people, it's mostly for the bears. Because the more we educate the people, the better off the bears are. And so I'm doing this not just for you guys, but I'm doing it mostly for them. Now, I have gone many, many places all over wherever I've lived and given lots of talks, talked to lots of people about bears. And what I have found throughout all my talks is there's two primary camps or ways of thinking about bears. The first camp is lots of people, unfortunately, have this unwarranted fear. They, they don't want to encounter them. They don't want to see them. It, it just brings this unwarranted fear. And I want to squash that because there's no reason for that. However, another camp that I frequently find are these people that absolutely love bears. And there's nothing wrong with loving bears as long as you do it properly. Because some people go over the top and provide unnecessary kindness to bears. In other words, they do things that may be detrimental to them, not realizing that they're actually hurting the bears because they're trying to be kind to the bears. Needless to say, both of those camps are not good. You shouldn't be afraid of them. You shouldn't love them so much that you hurt them. And so what I'm trying to do with all of these talks is I had the ultimate goal of just teaching people not just respect about black bears, but an understanding of what needs to be done in order to keep people, but mostly bears, safe. And that's one of the main reasons I give this talk. Now, this will allow us to jump into the main lesson of bears in your backyard. And so the main question at hand is, how do you live safely in bear country? And I imagine many folks joining in, you either live in bear country or you visit bear country quite a bit. This pertains to both. You don't have to be a full-time resident, but anytime you're recreating or vacationing or visiting bear country, this should be a part of your life. And so the question is, how do you do it? If you're in bear country, how do you go about your business in a safe manner, not just for you, but for the bears? The first thing a lot of people do is they turn to Google. And it, it's a good thing, it's a bad thing. Um, there's a lot of great information about many different topics when you turn to Google. For example, if you Google how to live in bear country, you're going to you're gonna find organizations like Be Bear Aware, Bear Smart, um, Center for Wildlife Information, and they've got lots of fantastic information about how to live with bears. But here's what I found. When you look at each and every one of these, they have a long list of do's and don'ts when you're in bear country. And depending on which one you visit, there's different circumstances to do this or do that. And it can very easily become overwhelming because there's just so much information thrown at you about how to do this. And so what I really try to do is to boil this down into something that's easy to understand and equates to all different kinds of situations. So if you want to learn to live safely in bear country, just ask. And it's an acronym, and I'm not a big fan of acronyms, but this one works really good. The reason I'm not a fan of acronyms, I work for the federal government now, and they use acronyms all the time that I don't even, to this day, I still don't even know what they mean. But to be safe in bear country, or how to live safely in bear country, you just ask. And what that acronym stands for, and is very pur purposeful for developing this, uh, there's three components to it. The A stands for you have to identify attractants. The S stands for you have to know what to do to stay safe. 
and the K is for you to be knowledgeable. And in particular, knowledgeable about the animal that you're concerned about. about. And so if you remember this acronym, identify, attract, and stay safe, be knowledgeable, the good thing with this is it's succinct. It's really straight, straightforward to the point, pretty easy to remember. And the cool thing, it applies to all situations. And not only does it apply to all situations, it applies to all animals in your backyard. And so even though today we're going to be talking about bears, same holds true for coyotes, raccoons, uh, skunks, bees, mountain lions. It doesn't matter what animal. If you use this acronym of just ask, you can know exactly what you need to do in order to peacefully coexist and stay safe. Uh, living in their, their habitat. So with that, I would love to be able to start with the letter A because that's that's what uh, starts the acronym. But I'm going to start with the K, the be knowledgeable, because one of the key components to to any lesson you learn is to Gain as much information and as much knowledge about the issue so you have a better understanding, not just of what you're doing, but why you're doing it. And because today's class or today's webinar is about black bears, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about black bears and teaching you about black bears. Because if you know a little bit about them, you understand your actions and, and what you have to do in relation to the bear's behavior and why they're doing things. So to get started here, and again, I'm sure some of you have seen this already, but I love giving this brief uh, lesson on black bears. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about just basic biology and behavior of bears. And so to start with, going to go through the color phases because we always talk about black bears and some people think black bears are black and absolutely they can be black. In fact, if you're on the East Coast, for those folks in North Carolina, um, Tennessee, Georgia, anywhere around that there, Virginia, Ginny, you're the same boat, almost every single bear that you encounter is going to be black. Uh, there is a little variation on the East Coast because every once in a while you'll get a black bear that has a white chest blaze. And so you might have a white patch on their chest. But for the most part, their outer coat is primarily black. But then when you head west, things change. And it's pretty awesome. I think it's beautiful. Out west, you have a lot of black bears that will have a brown or this blondish coloration. And so even though they're brown, brownish with these yellow highlights or mostly yellow with some brown highlights, varies either way, they are still black bears. A lot of people new to or visiting the West will see this brown colored black bear and think it's a grizzly. It's not. It's just a black bear. Another color that you will see quite often, especially in the Southwest, is what we call a cinnamon bear or the, it has this reddish color to them. Once again, it's still a black bear, but it it's, has a reddish coat to it. I think they're absolutely beautiful. Now, the two other colors that I find ultimately fascinating is, believe it or not, there are some black bears that are white. There is a population of bears on Kermode Island, which is off uh, British Columbia. It's western North America near Vancouver. And they have this population of bears that actually have a white coat. Now, these are not albinos. In fact, if you look at the, the eyes and the nose, albinos are have pink eyes and pink noses. These are just simply black bears with white fur coats. Uh, another name they go by is, besides Kermode bear, is a spirit bear. Obviously, they're held in high regard by the native peoples in those areas. Another coloration, which I think is just so incredibly cool, is in southeast Alaska, you have black bears that are nicknamed glacial bears that have this bluish tint to them, or a sil silvery bluish tint. Now, it's not like stark 
blue or stark silver, but uh, when the sun hits them just right, they have this this hue to them that just is absolutely brilliant and beautiful. And so I think it's fascinating that a black bear can come in almost any imaginable color. And so uh, that's something that a lot of people don't realize or don't know. Now, moving on, and this is where an understanding of just the physical characteristics of a bear comes in handy. And so when you're talking about black bears, the weight of them is, is not as big as people think. Yes, adult male black bears can get big. They range from 200 all the way up to 400 pounds. They can get bigger than that. They usually don't. Um, but when you're dealing with a bear that's in that 250 to 400 pound range, that's a large, typical male black bear. Female bears, on the other hand, are much smaller. They're usually in that 150 to 200 pound range. So you see a, a small female bear that is only 150 pounds. That's typical. They're not as big as people think. Now, having said that, uh, whenever people see bears, especially if they're not familiar or have not run into bears often, they have delusions of grandeur because they think bears are this larger-than-life type of creature, and they just think that they're these humongous animals. And I always relate to story for when I used to work at the Appalachian Bear Center where this woman had called in because she was concerned about a bear that was getting into her bird feeder. And when she called, I told, I instructed her about pulling her bird feeder in so the bear moves on. And she said, no, sir, that's not why I was calling. I'm just really concerned because this bear does not look well. It's really small. It's only about the size of my German Shepherd. And it's literally, it's emaciated. I could, it, I could see its rib cage. And so having described the bear like that, I asked her, I said, do you have any idea how much the bear weighs? And she says, sir, it can't be any more than 300 pounds. I don't know how many 300 pound German Shepherds are out there, but I don't think there's that many. But that just goes to show that people have this idea that bears are these huge animals. If the animal is only about the size of your German Shepherd, guess what? It's about the size of your German Shepherd. So having said that, I'll talk about some more of the physical characteristics. Um, they have home ranges. They're highly variable, but they can be quite large. Reason being they can be quite large is bears are eating machines. And so they're classified as omnivores, means they eat everything from leafy materials or vegetable matter all the way up to meat. Another classification that we use for bears is opportunistic, which literally means they will eat anything that's in front of them. Now because of that, and the, this fact that they're always eating, they're driven to find good food sources. And that's why their home range can be quite large, is if they find a berry field, they will spend a couple of days or a week eating as much food in that berry field as possible. And then they will go in search of another really good food source. And so they're constantly trying to find these really abundant and nutritious food sources. Um, one of the reasons why they eat so much is their body is designed to hibernate in the wintertime. I have a whole other webinar I teach on hibernation. But they've got to gain a lot of weight before they go into hibernation. And the fact that when they emerge from the den, they've lost a lot of weight. They only have a certain amount of months, six to eight months, of really eating as much as they can to pack that weight back on. So that's why they're eating machines. Now, what makes them truly special is their senses. And it's not all of their senses. But what makes them truly unique is um, one sense in particular. Now let's start with sight. Black bears don't have great eyesight. In fact, it's kind of similar to humans. And so if you're anything like me, your eyesight starts going after 40 years of age. But their eyesight is average at best. Now, their hearing is well above ours. They can hear us coming well before we could ever hear them moving through the woods. 
So their hearing is excellent. But what truly sets bears apart is their sense of smell. It is literally unparalleled, unequaled in the entire mammal world. In fact, it is said that the bear's sense of smell is the best in the entire mammal world. Now, what exactly does this mean? And so I've, I've written stories about the nose, the glorious nose, and I, I try to do my best to explain their sense of smell because this is what makes bears bears. And if you understand this, this helps you understand what you need to do when you live in bear country. So let's talk about their nose. First off, you don't know how bears smell, so the only thing we can relate to is how we smell. And so we as humans, you know what you can smell, what you can't smell. It's not a very good sense of smell. But in relation to our sense of smell, the next thing that we gravitate up to is our dogs. Now, our dogs, you know as well as I, your dog smells things that we cannot possibly fathom. You take the dog for a walk and all of a sudden it stops in a certain spot and it's so intent on sniffing that spot and we have no idea what's going on because we cannot smell that. You have to understand that a dog's sense of smell is about a hundred times better than ours. And the reason we know this is you can look at the number of olfactory receptors within the lining of a nose and they have a hundred times more receptors than we do. Now, if you're talking about the dog world, there is a dog that's notorious for its sense of smell, and that is the bloodhound. Now, the bloodhound has a sense of smell that's about 300 times better than a human sense of smell. That begins to show you like how incredibly strong their sense of smell is. Now, when it comes to a bear, a bear has a sense of smell that is seven times stronger than any bloodhound. So, using all those numbers I just threw at you, when you multiply it out, a bear's sense of smell is well over 2,000 times better than us. After I thought about that, and this was a while ago, after I thought about that and said 2,000 times, yeah, it still doesn't mean anything. I don't I don't know what 2,000 times better than us means. And so I came up with this analogy to hope, hopefully hammer home the point of how strong their sense of smell is. So let's take a can of beans. We go to the grocery store, we buy a can of beans, we come home, and we open up that can of beans, and we pour it into a pot on the stove, and we start cooking it. We, as humans, can smell those beans cooking. It smells really good. Now, you take that can of beans and you put it up to the bloodhound. That bloodhound can smell the beans within that can. That's how strong that bloodhound sense of smell is. Now, how strong is the bear? The bear can actually smell the perfume that was on the woman who put the beans in the can three weeks earlier. And so... This analogy here just says, holy cow, that bear sense of smell is just unbelievable. I cannot fathom that. Now, having said that, immediately, if you're like me, you're like, that's got to be sensory overload. If a bear can smell so, so much, its brain has to go bonkers because he could smell every single thing out there. And so I sat down and tried to figure out a good way to describe what is probably going on in the bear's mind. And the first thing, or the only thing, or the best thing that I came up with is Chuck E. Cheese. Um, now, if you've never been to a Chuck E. Cheese, you can just picture some type of arcade or bowling alley where there is a lot of commotion and a lot of screaming little kids going on. Now, if you have been to a Chuck E. Cheese, you know exactly what I'm talking about because as soon as you walk in, you are bombarded with bells and whistles and buzzers and kids screaming and waitresses yelling and there's just tons and tons and tons of noise distractions. Now when you go in there and you sit down, especially if you have your child with you or a child that you are the guardian of, if you're sitting at the table, you have all these sounds going on and all of a sudden your child falls and scrapes their knee and just calls out your name really loud, right away you're like, you, you hear that. 
you're you're tuned in to that sound of your child. So that is how I equate the bear's sense of smell. Now think about it. When a bear wakes up in the morning, it's going about its business. And I guarantee, I can almost promise you, it could smell the honey that is being produced in the beehive that's high up in the oak tree. No doubt it could smell that. It could also smell those blackberries that just ripened on the hillside a half mile down the road. The bear can smell that. Guarantee the bear can smell some of those grubs that are just waking up underneath the log that's down by the stream. Its sense of smell is so strong it could pick up every single one of these. But then there's something else that he smells. Off in the distance he smells this grill that has hot dogs and hamburgers and cheese and bacon. And so he's got all these stimuli coming at him through his nose and he can detect each and every one of these. What one is he going to key in on? Now he's looking for those high calories, really nutritious, bulking up to get fat type of food. And you got it. He is going to key in on those things he shouldn't be eating, like the hamburgers and the hot dogs and the bratwurst and the bacon. And so even though there's all this stimulus going on, he knows exactly where he wants to go. And this is really important to understand and why I spend so much time, understand why the, or why bears act like they do so then you can address your behaviors. So the good thing with black bear behavior is you have to understand bears are driven to eat. They wake up from the den, they're starving, they start eating, they start packing on pounds, and then from that point forward, it's nonstop trying to bulk up for the next hibernation. Unfortunately, natural foods are not always abundant. Sometimes they're really scarce out there. And the bad thing is humans are often careless with their food. And what that does, it ultimately leads to bears in your backyard. If you've got anything that smells good to eat, you're going to be attracting them. The good thing is bear behavior dictates they want nothing to do with us. So there's a few simple steps we can do to get them out of our backyard and back where they belong in the wild. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. So the first thing to be able to live safely in bear country and to avoid bears in your backyard is you have to learn to identify attractants. This is the A in the just ask. And so all you have to do, it's really simple, think about anything that may attract bears to your home. Anything that smells good. Put it this way, if you can smell it, I promise you the bear can smell it. So let's start simple. Everybody knows this. You've seen bumper stickers, you've seen signs, garbage kills bears. One of the main reasons garbage um, is brought up in this is it attracts bears. There's so many odors. Most people know garbage does not smell good. To us, it smells like a smorgasbord to bears. And so garbage undoubtedly will attract bears to your, to your home if you have it out there. Now, it's unsightly. Whenever you have garbage left outside, bears inevitably get into it. And no one likes seeing this. I don't like seeing bears in garbage cans or in areas where they, they have a garbage bag in their mouth. I've seen numerous piles of bear scat where they have candy wrappers and and all sorts of crazy stuff in there, tin foil. And this is not a sight anyone wants to see. But this is what happens when bears are drawn to your home. And obviously, if you're vacationing somewhere, you do want to see a bear, but this is not something that's very picturesque. You don't want to see bears around garbage. Most people, fortunately, understand that garbage is a huge issue for bringing bears in around developed areas, around your home. But what about those things that are not so obvious? We have to think about those too. So let's start with this picture. It's a picture of a typical back porch somewhere in Appalachia, Rocky Mountains, doesn't matter where it's in. It could be in bear country and, and right away you say, hey, there's no garbage out there. They're doing great. What do you see on there? Yep, 
you don't realize it, but unknowingly you put out an attractant if you feed your pet outside. So that dog food bowl might be something that you just completely don't think about. Now, a situation like this where you're feeding your your dog, whatever animal you have out there, obviously if you're putting food out for your pet or your horse or your mule, it's going to attract a bear because they'll find this just as nutritious as your dog might find it. Now, understand if it's good for a dog, it's good for a bear. If it's good for a cat, it's good for a bear. So any kind of pet food that you put out to attract your pets is undoubtedly going to attract bears. And so you got to be mindful of that. Here is another big one that many people don't think about. A lot of people do think about it, but many people don't realize that bird seed, and there's a lot of people that, that put out bird feeders, bird seed is a huge attractant for bears. One of the main reasons, it's high in calories. It packs pounds on really, really quick. And bears will do anything to get at it. They'll knock things over. Once they knock it over, they'll, they'll lick it off the ground until it's all clear. But they teach their cubs on how to get into these bird feeders. And they become very acrobatic and very adept into getting at bird feeders. And a lot of people try to bear-proof their bird feeders. And I will tell you, there's no such thing as anything being bear-proof because bears are extremely intelligent. And they will do anything to get at a bird feeder including the acrobatics. And so I'm not saying that you should not put out bird seed and feed the birds if that's what you like to do. Just be mindful that if you live in bear country, this is likely to attract bears to your backyard. Now, just because it's bird seed, that's not the only kind you have to be mindful of. Obviously, if you feed hummingbirds, after the bear has eaten all the seed, it's going to go over to the hummingbird feeder because that's its Gatorade. That's what bears absolutely love. High calorie sugar water is fantastic for adding those calories that the bear needs to put on weight. And so just because it's in liquid form doesn't make it any less attractive to the bears. So feeding birds, feeding pets outside is something that we're not telling you to stop doing but just identify and know that you have potential to draw in bears. Now, what are some other things in your neighborhood or in your backyard that may attract bears? This isn't real common. Some people do, however, like um, to make their own honey or let the bees make their own honey. And so some folks actually operate beehives to do that. Obviously, everyone knows stories of bears being attracted to honey. The funny thing is, one of the things they're mainly attracted to is actually the larvae of the baby bees or the, the young bees. And so besides the treat of the honey, they get a lot of protein out of eating the larvae within the beehives. And so you attract a bear to an apiary or any, any area that you're trying to produce honey, and they're going to do lots of damage. They're, they're going to destroy the thing looking to get at that really nutritious food source. And most folks know that bees aren't impacted by bee stings because their fur is so thick. Um, usually the nose and the lips are the one area on a bear that it does hurt. But they'll go through a lot of honey, a lot of uh, destruction to get at that before they're finally driven off. So besides beehives, another common thing, especially in, if you live in the country, is raising your own livestock or chickens. And so people have chicken coops out there. Now, if you have a hungry bear moving through the area and you have chickens penned up, um, you're making it easy for the bear. And so you have to do certain things, hopefully put an electric fence around it, uh, keep that bear from getting at the chicken coop. And I'm gonna talk more about this in just a little bit. But if they can get into the coop, they're going to do lots of damage. Besides killing the chickens, they're going to tear apart everything to get at that food source. So you have to be mindful. You have to understand that these chicken coops could be an attractant to an unwanted bear. Now, okay, we talked about the hot dogs and hamburgers on the grill, but some people will say, well, 
I cook all the food, I bring it inside the house, the bear cannot get in. You have to understand that those grills still maintain a lot of the grease, it still maintains a lot of the odors, and those grills, those barbecue um, grills, hold that odor and become a huge attractant for a bear. Now, a lot of it has to do with the grease that falls off and gets trapped inside of there. And you have to understand that even if you live in a really developed area where you're in a neighborhood or you're near a restaurant type of thing, it's still just as attractive. It doesn't matter that there's more people in the area. The bears simply come in under the cover of darkness to get at these food sources. And so just because additional humans are there, as long as that attractant is there, the bears are still going to be coming in. What about other things around your house that could bring bears in? A lot of people like to create compost piles for their garden. This is great, fantastic way to recycle things. Just understand that it has the potential to draw in a bear, especially if there's any meat products or anything. You're not supposed to put meat products, but eggshells or anything that smells good is going to bring that bear into your compost pile. And last but not least, uh, you don't think about it. You could have your whole backyard all cleaned up. There's no, there's no garbage, no food sources, no anything in your backyard to draw bears. However, you decide to take the day cooking pies and you're airing out your house or putting the pies on your windowsill to cool. I don't know anyone that does that anymore, but any aroma that is generated from within your house that can escape through the windows or whatever, once again, it's pretty simple to understand. Something smells good for you to eat. It's going to smell good for a bear to eat. And so the last thing you want to do is come to your front door and have this thing staring at you because he smells something good cooking inside. Now, when this happens... You have to understand that anything that smells good for you to eat um, is definitely going to be something that's going to attract bears. So if you attract them, and sometimes it's inevitable, you, you have things at your house that undoubtedly smell good to bears. The end result is this. A bear is going to come in, and it ha if it has access to, for example, the garbage, they're going to make a mess. They're going to tear apart that garbage, get whatever they're looking for inside, and just leave it in a whole lot worse shape than they found it. The bad thing is it begins to change their behavior. And so they begin to break into things. Uh, anything that is stored within a shed, especially if it's a flimsy shed that can easily be broken into, they're going to do it to get access to that rich food source. Again, if you have apiaries, they're going to destroy the apiaries. If you store something in your vehicle, this is actually damage to the inside of a pickup truck where the bear was just trying to get at food inside the pickup truck. It absolutely destroyed the inside of that pickup truck. You know what's even worse than a truck? If they get in your home. This is not common, um, but occasionally like vacation or summer homes, uh, this occurs, or if a, if a home is way back in bear country and, and it's vacant for quite a bit, bears will break in to try to get at the food sources. And this scene right here is something you never want to come home to because what happens is if a bear is doing that, its behavior is already altered. And so those bears, instead of being afraid of people, they start getting more and more bold because... They're trying to gain access to people food. And so their behavior changes. And they start doing things that they normally wouldn't be doing. And so they're getting into areas in the daylight, um, really becoming more aggressive, more bold, breaking into things. This picture here is a mother teaching her cubs how to break into a garage. And before you know it, you can end up with a situation like this. And I'm wondering out there, I can't hear you or see you, if anyone laughed when they saw this picture. I'll raise my hand. The first time I saw it, I don't know if I laughed, but I smiled because it's like, ah, there's a bear in a bathtub. And then it dawned on me, and I had this, com this conversation with Brian Peterson from Bear Smart Durango. It shouldn't be, th this shouldn't be something that we teach people 
is cute. Because unfortunately, if this situation occurs, it doesn't smell, spell good things for bears. Now this bear was not killed by this officer, but the bear has to be removed. And these bears that are used to being around people, used to breaking into things, getting into houses, most of them do get put down. But most of all, the reason it's so dangerous, because it's altering their behavior, you're going to end up with situations like this. There's so many more risks for the bears. They're getting hit by cars. They're getting um, harassed by dogs. They're getting poisoned from eating the wrong thing in the garbage can. You end up with dead bears. And that's what nobody wants to see. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So this is the reason why we have to be so mindful of our attractants. Because the bears, by their biology, are driven to find something really good to eat. And so what are some solutions to all of this? And this leads us to the last letter we'll discuss today. How do you stay safe? Now, this talk can go all different ways from safety and um, when you're hiking in bear country. But this is pretty much how to do it around your home. What do you do to prevent these bears from coming into your home area? Well, the first thing you should do is know if there are bears in your area. And there's lots of neighborhood watch groups, but you don't even have to be part of a neighborhood watch group. You just be a good neighbor. And so if you notice a bear on your drive home that's getting close to your neighborhood, let your neighbors know about it. Because they might have something on their back porch or in their front yard that they don't want the bear to get into. And so just knowing that bears are, your, are in your area is step one for staying safe. So what are the solutions? What do you have to do now to prevent any encounters or, or any bad things happening to that bear? Well, it's really simple. We're going to go back to those attractants. What, why is that bear there? Because bears are afraid of people. But he's coming in or she's coming in to get at something in your backyard or in your front yard around your home. So what do you do? Well, let's think of some of those things that are easy to address. Uh, the garbage, the bird feeder, the pet food, your grill. Those things are easy to move. And so remove it. Get that out of the area so the bear can't get access to it. If it involves putting it in your garage for a day or two until the bear moves on, that's all you have to do. Really, really simple fix. Whatever you do, don't try to bear-proof it. And um, I said it before, there's no such thing as a bear-proof anything. Now, there's bear-resistant stuff, but bears are just so incredibly smart, so incredibly strong, that they usually find a way to get into anything that they're not supposed to get into. So don't try to bear-proof it because they'll outsmart you. But the simplest thing, again, pull it inside, just store it in a secure location. As soon as the bear doesn't have access to that, they move on. Well, what if those things are difficult to remove? I mentioned earlier the, the beehives or the apiaries, the chicken houses, the compost piles. You can't move those inside. So what do you do in that case? In that case, there's things that you have to do in addition to what you normally do. And so I don't know if Brian joined in. I, I'll check. But uh, building an electric fence around an apiary or a chicken coop is absolutely critical, especially if bears are common in your area, because at some point or another, the bear's going to get stressed and going to try to get at that food source. So bear putting, uh, I shouldn't say bear proofing it, but putting the electric fence will serve as a deterrent. And so these deterrents are meant just to send a reminder to a bear that this is not a food source he should be feeding on. Now, some people ask about scare tactics. Uh, what if I blow a horn or shine, or I keep the lights on at night? The thing with scare, ta scare tactics, if they are repeated over and over and there's no negative stimulus for the bear, it soon tunes it out. A word for this is called habituation. A lot of people use it for a lot of other things as well. But habituation, the, the root of that word is habit. So if things are repeated over and over, the bear can tune them out because it's a habit for him. So he becomes habituated to seeing the lights on in your backyard. 
where he gets used to hearing that car siren go off. And so they become ineffective. ineffective. And so when it comes to a deterrent, a deterrent you want to have something that causes some type of shock or pain. Now, we don't want to hurt bears. That's the last thing we want to do. But they have these unwelcome mats that might be electrified. So a bear steps on it. It's kind of like touching an electric fence. Um, pepper spray. Different things. Now, I'm not um, telling anyone to use pepper spray on, on bears. But some of these things that really leave a mark or leave a really strong impression on a bear, those things are the things that work best. Because... Obviously, no no bear wants to experience any of that stuff. And so you never want to get to this extreme because obviously the bear is still trying to get at something. And so you can deal with it long before you have to go to these measures. Now, say you do everything right. You have no garbage outside. Your bird seeds put up. Um, you do everything that I told you to do, but you're still having bears in your area because your neighbor two doors down don't give two hoots and they leave their garbage in the wide open and they've got pet food, everything else laying out there and the bears are coming through my yard to get to my neighbor's house. That's a really tough situation, especially for you because you're doing everything right. Once in a while, it takes more action than, than that. And so it could very well come to a point, and many, many municipalities all throughout bear country, from Gatlinburg to Durango to Aspen, Colorado to California, all over the country in these highly populated touristy areas that have lots of people and lots of bears, they have to pass ordinances or some kind of law to make everybody do it because that one bad apple spoils the lot, you could do everything right, but if your neighbors aren't doing it, you're still being impacted by it. And so talking to elected officials to say, hey, how do we clean up this neighborhood? How do we clean up this town to make sure that we're doing everything we can, not just to help us, but to help the bears? And that's where these um, community-based programs start out. It takes people, not like me, but like you, to get the ball rolling in order to do good things within your community. So, having said that, I'm wrapping up my talk here. I want you to remember that your efforts to be bear smart, to do good things in bear habitat, to keep bears from being a constant <laughs> reminder in your backyard, being bear smart helps them just as much as it helps you. And so in summary, if you wanna know how to deal with bears in your backyard, just remember, you just ask. Remember, identify those attractants. Identify whatever is going to bring that bear into your, into your backyard. Know what to do to rectify that and how to stay safe, to keep those bears out of there. And just be knowledgeable about them. I, I taught you everything you need to know about bears and why they, they act like they do. And that's everything you need to, to know how to handle bears in your backyard. And so with that... I want to thank you. I love talking to you guys. I'll, I'll answer whatever questions you have for as long as you want. But first, before we go to that, I always got to give photo credits. Um, the one person I want to call out here, Brian Peterson, he supplied a good chunk of the photos for this particular presentation. A lot of these with the bears in the garbage, that was around Durango, Colorado. And they're doing a fantastic job of trying to clean up that town. But a lot of other folks contribute pictures, and I want to give them credit. And last but not least, if you like this presentation or similar presentations, um, I keep talking about this website that's coming soon. Hopefully it will be coming soon. Um, but one of the things that you can do to keep abreast of what presentations are coming up, follow us on Facebook, that Wildlife for You. Just type it in on Facebook and like the page, and I'll post upcoming webinars as they come up. I will tell you, I'm trying to get out of me being the sole star. I love talking to you. I would be the only one doing it, but there's other people that are way better than I am um, to give some of this wildlife information. And so hopefully here soon, in fact, February, we're doing it again. We're bringing in Kim Delosier. I've got a couple other folks lined up to um, 
to give their take on some of these issues. So hopefully you'll join in there. And I believe most people today, I've got your email address, but um, if you don't think I have it and you want to receive an email for any time these new webinars come up, make sure you type it in the, in the chat box. So with that, the last thing, this is, I promise, is my very last slide. I do have a webinar coming up this Thursday about timber wolves, or gray wolves to be more correct. Um, icons of American uh, of Wild America. This webinar was actually because of you guys. I, I asked you guys via email what topics do you want to hear about, and timber wolves was the most requested topic. So this Thursday I'm doing it same time, eight o'clock Eastern, six o'clock Mountain Time. But it'll be all about wolves, basic biology, their range, all that fun stuff. Pretty basic stuff, but. I can almost guarantee everyone will learn something that they didn't know. In fact, I learned as I was putting it together. One that I'm really looking forward to is already scheduled in February, February 27th. So it's about a month from now. Uh, Kim Delosier is joining me again to talk about uh, bear tales and some crazy stories about bears we've worked with. Actually, we might vary and tell some other wildlife stories because we're loaded with them. But Kim will be joining us again for Bear Tales. That'll be the third edition of that. But if you want to join in, uh, by all means, I'd love to see you there. If you take that advertisement, I think I sent it out in an email or on the Facebook page. If you advertise this on any of your Facebook hunting groups, um, I'll knock $5 off that registration fee just so you help spread the word. So I hope to see you there. And with that... That was the last of my slides, and from this point forward, um, if you have any questions, I'm here as long as, <coughs> excuse me, as long as you want me to be. So <coughs> go ahead and type away. All right. Well, I know, <laughs> I feel bad. I knew a couple people I was pushing their bedtime, so... Any questions about bears in your backyard? Let's see if I can go to a better, that's a better picture, I guess. And just so you know, the, the very first time I did a webinar, <clears throat> I, I would stop every 10 minutes and ask for questions. And I think my very first webinar lasted an hour and 45 minutes. So. Thanks for your patience just listening to me drone on. But uh, I think it's easier because if people need do need to bug out, at least they, they saw everything that I presented. All right, Molly asks a great question. What if a bear showed up at your screen door? Do you shut the main door and call the wildlife authorities? It's It seems intuitive to some people, but some people... Here's the thing, bears cause a reaction, and you might not do what you think you would do. But if that situation occurs where you go to leave your front door, and there's a bear on your porch or right by that door, yes, obviously the very first thing is close that door, put something in between you and that bear. Now, I can almost guarantee, I can't say it for certain, but I can almost guarantee if you open up a door and there's a bear there, that bear is taking off. You're going to scare the, the, the backside out that bear. However, every once in a while, once in a blue moon, the bear doesn't act as it should because they're more habituated, they're more used to people. And so those are the bears you got to be concerned about. They're not like super mean or anything, but they're very inquisitive and they're just trying to get at whatever food source they smell. So you close the door, you put something in between you and that bear, the bear is not going to be breaking down your door. It's not like the great outdoors with the grizzly and John Candy. Um, the bear is not going to try breaking down the door. Um, however, if you have a window that has just a screen there that's very flimsy, a bear can easily push that in. So close your windows, close your door. The bear is not getting inside. By all means, call the wildlife authorities. If you want to call, if you're that worried about it and you don't know where the bear goes, um, Call someone to come over. I want to go so far to say call 911, but definitely call your wildlife authorities. And if they have someone in the area, they will send someone out. 
you can even call your neighbor and just say, hey, there's a bear here. Do you still see it? And so obviously you don't want to have close contact with a bear. So always make sure that there's something in between you and them. All right, Kelly says, I'd be so terrified that if I reported the bear to anyone, the wildlife officials would kill it. Is this standard, or do most agencies try non-lethal methods like relocation? That is such a fantastic question. And that is, that is a pervasive thought in the general public. And, and I will tell you without a doubt, some bears do get killed. I worked for a wildlife agency as a bear coordinator. I, I dealt with a lot of bear issues. And Kelly, I will tell you, first and foremost, almost everyone I have ever worked with the very last thing that we want to do is put a bear down. That is the, we, we don't even like thinking about that. So this idea that agencies just want to kill the bears is couldn't be further from the truth. Now, sometimes agencies have to make decisions that a lot of people don't like. And having said how how difficult it is to put a bear down, I will also tell you that I don't have a problem putting a bear down if there's true concern that their that bear can injure somebody. And that is usually when, when a bear is put down, it's for that reason, is because as much as we love animals, we value human life above these animals. And so if there's a situation where a bear breaks into a house, that bear is beyond the point of acting like a normal bear. And if it breaks into one house and we were to go there and capture it and relocate it, all you're doing is moving a problem. And so, and I know of situations where a problem was moved from one area to another area. And can you imagine the guilt on the, on the people involved at the wildlife agency if they moved a bear to another area and that bear ends up hurting somebody or god forbid killing someone that's something they cannot take a chance with and so sometimes depending upon the act that the bear did the bear needs to be put down just to protect human life now i understand it's a long shot but it's it's not worth the gamble but i agree with you uh, there's a lot of folks that are afraid to call the wildlife agency because they think that's their first move let me try to assure you that is not if there's a solution, a non-lethal solution, that is what we're going to go for first. Now, most states, it, it depends on states. I can't tell you what every state does, but a lot of states still relocate bears. If a bear shows up in an area it's not supposed to be, it's in a garbage can or breaks into someone's shed, they trap the bear and move it. It's only when there's true concern that that bear may hurt someone that they go through the, the measure of actually putting that bear down. Because like I said, myself, Nobody I worked with ever wanted to do that. That's the last thing we want to do. But sometimes we're forced to do it. Okay. <laughs> Molly asked about the photo. Is that bear really on a trampoline? No, that's that's not a trampoline. That, that's a mat to catch the bear. So that bear was tranquilized. It's falling out of the tree. Having, I love that picture because it cracks me up. The, the bear was fine. It landed on the mat. They um, loaded it up into a... a cage and they they hauled it off there is a video out there and i gotta tell you it it was one of those brilliant not so brilliant moves because they were trying to tranquilize a bear and they didn't have one of these mats and so they did use a trampoline and after <laughs> just, just google it look it up bear in a trampoline and, and you'll see it um i the bear thankfully the bear wasn't injured but it, it's it, it's one of those not so smart moves, I guess I should say. Kelly, I, I think <laughs> I think we're talking about the same video because the trampoline did not break its fall; it just propelled him even, even further. I, I'm almost certain that bear was was fine after that, but it it definitely bounced when it hit that trampoline. <gasps> All right, any other? Oop. 
Oh, I'm sorry, Teresa, I missed your question. What about bug spray if you're using it in bear country? That, that's a, another awesome question. And I do, I do have a presentation about, in fact, I'm giving it live and in person tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening. It's called Lions and Hikers and Bears. And it's about uh, hiking and recreating in bear and cougar country. Um, that's one thing that people don't think about. Because when you're camping, uh, you cook your food. Everyone knows the smells they put up when they cook their food. And they do most things correct because they get the food out of camp. But sometimes they have other items, toiletries. A great example, the bug spray, lotions that they put on. Now, bug spray, for the most part, I, I don't know or haven't heard of bears particularly being attracted to bug spray. That generally doesn't smell like something good to eat, excuse me. But people, if they brush their teeth with some minty toothpaste or put deodorant on, something that smells sweet or good to us, even though it's not a food product, it still smells sweet and good for a bear to eat. So when he comes into that toothpaste smell, that minty smell, it's not because he knows there's toothpaste in there. He thinks he's getting some other food source. And so lotions that are uh, coconut flavor or melon flavor, obviously they're smelling like a food product. Um, I think you'd be pretty safe with bear spray. Never heard of any situation where it has attracted bears. But definitely be mindful, just because it's not a food source doesn't mean it's okay. If it smells good to you, it's going to smell good to the bears. Yeah, great point, Kelly. Um, I forget. There's a couple of home remedies for insects and other bugs that definitely use more natural products. Um, when you said bug spray, I was thinking more like auth or um, those chemicals that they put in there that don't smell normal. But yes, if you have those home re remedies that include mint or lavender, again, if you are in bear country, especially if you're backpacking in bear country, don't have those things inside the tent with you. Don't apply them to your skin before you crawl into the tent. Um, now, if you're walking and hiking, I'm sure it's fine to use those because a bear is not going to um, be searching you out as you're walking. They're going to run from you. But if, if if it's nighttime and you're asleep and the bear doesn't see any commotion and it's just going by his sense of smell, then yes, that's not a good thing to have with you in your tent. All right. Molly asks, what would one do if backpacking in bear country? What do you use for toothpaste, deodorant, et cetera? Or do you just skip all of that? Well, I know lots of people that skip all of that, but lots of people don't want to skip all of that. Camping stores, when you go to REI and some of those more, um, they're, they're geared more towards camping. There are lots of deodorant soaps, uh, or not, I shouldn't say deodorants. There are soaps that are scentless. Um, the deodorant, I wouldn't go for anything really floral. Again, if you apply those things during the day while you're while you're hiking because it makes you feel better, that's no problem. When you go to bed, just wash up. Um, you don't have to apply a new coat right before you go to bed. And so anything that is smelling strong because it's freshly applied obviously is going to have more attraction power than something that's been there all day long. And so in the morning when you get up, I don't see any problem using any of those products. It's when you're getting ready to turn into bed because understand the nighttime is generally when bears are feeding. And so they're just going by their nose in most situations. And so at nighttime is really when you have to pay most attention to any of those arom aromatic products you may be using. <laughs> yes, that's the key. That's the key to camping or hiking. You don't have to un outrun the bear. You just have to outrun the slowest person in camp. <clears throat> I 
I see Kelly typing a question. Huh. I appreciate the webinar comment. Um, what does my day job include? I um, I still work for the I work for the federal. I'm still a biologist. I'm helping the federal government out and I'm working here in Santa Fe, New Mexico on some of the, the national forests, uh, helping them with forest planning on how to better manage the wildlife in the forest. And so I would say my job back in Tennessee was a whole lot better, but my location here in the Rockies, um, when I was back in Tennessee, I was in Nashville. Nashville was great but it definitely wasn't the Rocky Mountains. And so, um, yeah, I, I could do this all day long. In fact, my boss at work today laughed because I told her I have a, a webinar today, a bear talk tomorrow, and then another webinar, a wolf webinar on Thursday. And she laughed about how my free time is never free. It's doing something I love to do, but it's not like people go to the movies or go to bars or travel or anything. I, um, <laughs> I love what I do. And, and this is something that I would rather be doing this than, um, doing a lot of other things. So Kelly says, I vacillate between wanting to see bears and knowing that, that if I'm not, they're safe from the ones who don't like them. It's tough. Um, I love seeing bears. I will tell you, when I first moved to Tennessee, this is back 1997, I was still pretty young in my early 20s, didn't have a lot of bear experience, but here I was hired to manage the Appalachian Bear Center. And one of my first trips was to Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and I went to one of the hotels there that was notorious for having bears around it. And I remember pulling up in my Jeep Wrangler with top down doors off and there were some bears standing in the parking lot. And I, it was one of those things that initially your stomach clenches because it's like, there's a bear. And then this calm came over me that said, Hey, there's a bear. <laughs> and from that point forward, I loved the fact that that I woke up in the morning and there was a pile of bear scat in my driveway. I, I live when I was with the bear center in the middle of bear country. So bears moved around our house all the time. There's something that's just really awesome about seeing bears and where a lot of people get nervous, I get excited. So um, that's one thing I miss. I love encountering bears, whether I'm driving or hiking or, or whatever. It's just an awesome experience. Kelly, you, you bring up a good point, and this is the reason why I do what I do. Now, there's a lot of biologists out there that love working with whatever animals. Obviously, I love bears and other... I love all animals, but I just have a passion for these large carnivores kind of thing. There's a lot of biologists out there that want to do the biology and only work with the animal. And... They're really intelligent, really smart, but they're also really missing a big part of wildlife management because you cannot help an animal unless you educate the people on what that animal needs because you can't do it alone. It takes the whole community, the whole general public understanding about these animals in order for animals to thrive. And that's where, that's where I differ than a lot of folks because a lot of folks want to get buried up to their elbows looking for whatever animal they're chasing. Um, and I enjoy, I, I love doing that, but I love meeting the people that are just as passionate about it, but may not know as much about I do and kind of teaching them so they can carry the torch and teach everyone around them. So that's where I'm a little bit different than some folks. Kelly, I, I don't think you have to worry too much. You, there's definitely concern. I understand what you're saying, 
because you may not want certain people to be seeing the bears. But the cool thing is, in, in fact, I can tell, I, I, I apologize on the front end if I bore anyone, but in Tennessee, the bear population was expanding. And as a wildlife agency, we, we wanted to be able to manage as they were expanding, to be able to know where they're going and to be able to address the problems that bears sometimes cause with the conflict with humans. And so a big part of the equation, what I just talked about, is you have to educate the public. And the big unknown in Tennessee was, does the public want bears around? And so we hired, we, we paid tens of thousands of dollars for a survey to be conducted in Tennessee that asked the question of, do you want bears around? And we were blown away at the results. It was almost, I think it was 87%. So it was almost nine out of 10 people said they wanted bears in their county. That's over, I never expected that. I thought it would be around 50%, but 90% of the folks said they'd love seeing bears in their county. Now, when we started asking the question, well, what if they're in your town? What if they're in your backyard? And so the closer and closer that bear got to their house, the less support they had. So people, what that tells us is people love bears. They want bears around, but they don't want them too close. And so the fact that you might have a bear wandering through your neighborhood, don't believe that there's a lot of people out there that hate it, want it, want it dead or moved or whatever. It may spur some anxiety, but the overwhelming majority of people love that, love the fact that there's bears out there. So, Well, Kelly, if you have a lot of professional photos that you're willing to share, <laughs> I am always looking for them to put into my slide presentations. In fact, some of those those folks that I credited, Bob Houdeshell, I, I gave a talk, I think last Thursday. It was a photography club in North Carolina that asked me to give the hibernating, the super sleeper presentation. And I gave that talk to them, and there was about 30 people in that photography club. And um, one of the photographers, Neil Jernigan, sent me his website and said, Take, use whatever pictures you need for these bear presentations. And so I just checked with him, and um, the, the flyer that I put up, in fact, let me go to it. This bear tails, I, this picture here of bear tails, that's one of his photos. I, it's, it's like a Winnie the Pooh type of photo. It's just an incredible photo. I've, in fact, I've got a couple others I have. So if you have any photos that uh, you're willing to share and let me use for some of these educational talks. I'm, I'm all for it. Yeah, I, I swear I stared at that and I said, he, that's got to be like photoshopped or something, but um, he just had a whole plethora of bear photos. And this one I, I just thought was just so incredibly cool.